So it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Natarajan Meghnathan. You can call him Meg, as he said. I would call I'd call him Natarajan. He has been a close collaborator of ours for a long time now. I would say close to ten years, and um, is a professor at Jackson State University for more than fifteen years now. Uh, he worked with us during our first foray into network science, and now he's also part of our expeditions proposal. And he's been doing some really cool work doing structure analysis and dynamic analysis of networks. Uh, he has done work on centrality measures in the past as well, and I bring it up because Ravi pointed out that today would have been the hundredth birthday for Frank Harare. For those of you who don't know, along with uh, Paul Erdős, you know, Frank and Paul are the two giants of graph theory, and uh, I think it's a befitting talk to have today from Natarajan, who has also done a lot of work on on centrality measures. And uh, it's Frank's hundredth birthday today. He passed away, uh, unfortunately, some time back. And he was in New Mexico uh, University for for a while, and had a chance to interact with him then. But Natarajan, over to you. Take over for a second. Thank you, Madhav. Uh, good morning, everyone. My talk today is going to be on cluster analysis, but we're not uh, going to look at in clustering algorithms. So. It's like an indirect way of assessing or quantifying what is a measure of intra-cluster density of a, the blocking cluster of a complex network. So what I mean by blocking cluster is we're looking going to look at information cascade, and um, so we're going to see the information cannot penetrate easily through all the clusters in the network. So there exists some blocking clusters into which it's very difficult for information to penetrate. So we're going to focus how to quantify the intra-cluster density of such blocking clusters using the information cascade approach. So again, just a quick review of what is information cascade. Most of you would know this. The information cascade is a phenomenon in complex networks in which one or more nodes in the network will try to adopt a decision based on the decision made by the neighbor nodes. So this is like in social networks and all these networks, you have two people who have made the final decision and regarding say buying some particular product or voting for someone uh, like that and uh, using those people as what's called initial adopters we would like to make everyone in the network adopt the same decision so like in this example i have i'm showing here you have say two and six as initial adopters and uh, in this research we will have what is called a threshold fraction of neighbors who need to have adopted the decision so only if that fraction of neighbors have adopted the decision then the neighbors who have not yet adopted will adopt a decision so we'll call that fraction as q which is a threshold fraction of uh, neighbors to should have adopted the decision and in this example i'm setting that to be half so what it means then is uh, the numbers I have written here on the top indicate the fraction of neighbors who have currently adopted the decision. So for node one, it has three neighbors. One of its three neighbors, which is node two, has adopted the decision. So by the way, two and six are the initial adopters, which are colored as green. So likewise for node five, uh, it has four neighbors and two of its neighbors have adopted and so on. So we go through a series of sequence of iterations. Uh, in each iteration, you will have some one or more nodes like adopting a decision. If uh, the fraction of the neighbors who adopt the decision is greater than or equal to this threshold Q. So in this case, the first iteration, five and six have half uh, as the fraction of neighbors who adopt the decision. So they'll go ahead and adopt the decision because half is greater than or equal to half. Because of that, the numbers for the other nodes who have not yet adopted will change. So node one will now have two of its three neighbors to adopt the decision and so on. So the next iteration, the other four nodes will adopt the decision. So in two iterations, we'll have all these eight nodes adopting the same decision. So if all the uh, nodes come to the same decision, then this is called a complete information cascade. It's also called global cascade. For a given set of initial adopters, the largest possible value for the threshold fraction Q of adopted neighbors that can lead to any complete information cascade is called the cascade capacity of the network. So for example, in this figure here, if that threshold fraction Q uh, is more than half, say uh, two third or something, then uh, no new node will adopt the decision. So if no new node adopts the decision, then we cannot proceed further. 
So for this given a set of initial adopters two and six, half is the cascade capacity of this network. In prior research, people have studied, okay, how to choose initial adopters and the centrality metrics have been very useful for that. So what people have observed is uh, nodes chosen based on either degree centrality or between a centrality were observed to be more effective in speeding up the adoption process. So in this research also, I'll be uh, using both of them. So we can choose either based on degree centrality or between a centrality and we'll see how things change uh, depending on either of them. Now, coming to clusters, clusters, as you all know, is a subset of the nodes in the network that have more links among themselves compared to the links with the rest of the nodes in the network. And clusters are considered to be a, like a major bottleneck for uh, accomplishing what's called complete information cascade. So by now what I mean, a complete information cascade is all the nodes in the network should adopt the same decision. Now, there are some nodes in a cluster called bridge nodes. Those are the nodes that will have links to nodes both within the cluster and outside the cluster. So in this figure here, node two is the bridge node for this cluster, one, two, three, four. And as you see, it has links to both nodes within the cluster and outside the cluster. And again, node six here is a bridge node for this cluster of six, seven, eight, nine. So we are going to measure, focus here on intra-cluster density of the clusters. So by definition, what intra-cluster, again, there are a lot of definitions out there. So the definition that is most suitable to analyze the penetration capability for information cascade, we are going to look at this definition. It's the minimum of the intra-cluster density of the bridge nodes of the cluster. How do you measure the intra-cluster density of the bridge node of, in a cluster? It is a ratio of the number of neighbors inside the cluster and the total number of neighbors. So in this case, for node two, it has four neighbors. Among these four neighbors, three of them are within the cluster. So the intra-cluster density of this bridge node two is going to be three over four. So again, intra-cluster density in general is basically a measure of the number of uh, links connecting the nodes within the cluster. And inter-cluster density is a measure of number of links connecting nodes within the cluster to nodes outside the cluster. So you're not going to focus on inter-cluster density, you're going to look at intra-cluster density. So there's only one bridge node for each of these two clusters here, so the minimum is the same number. So the intra-cluster density of this cluster is going to be 3 over 4, and here also it is 3 over 4. So now continuing with this example, if I choose uh, node 5 as my initial adopter, and that's the only initial adopter for this network, then if my threshold fraction Q of adopted neighbors needed for the new nodes to adopt a decision is greater than one fourth. Okay, now if you look at the number here for node 2, one fourth of its neighbors, one over four, is the fraction of its neighbors who have adopted the decision, which is like node 5 among the four neighbors. So if I make my Q to be greater than four, then neither node two nor node six, neither of them will adopt a decision. So if neither of them are adopting a the decision, then the other nodes within the cluster will not be adopting a decision and we cannot have complete information cascade. So if Q is greater than one fourth here, that is, it means like one minus Q is less than Three fourth because one minus one fourth is three fourth. So one minus q is less than three fourth. Then the cluster one, two, three, four, and likewise the cluster six, seven, eight, nine cannot be penetrated. So what it means is then if one minus q is less than the intra cluster density, then the cluster cannot be penetrated. Okay. So that means for a cluster to be penetrable, one minus q has to be greater than or equal to the intra cluster density. So rearranging this, it means Q has to be less than or equal to one minus intra-cluster density in order for the cluster to be penetrable. So what it means is if, uh, if you have a cluster of some intra-cluster density, then for information cascade to penetrate to that cluster, the threshold fraction of neighbors that you should have, which is this Q, who have already adopted a decision, should be less than or equal to one minus intra-cluster density. So that means now if Q is equal to one minus intra-cluster density, because that's the maximum value you can enforce on threshold fraction of neighbors who need to have adopted the decision. So then that's called the cascading capacity of the cluster. Okay. 
And so each class cell has a cascading capacity based on the intracluster density of the bridge nodes. And the minimum of such cascading capacities of all the clusters put together will be called the cascading capacity of the network. So like in this case here, you have three clusters and U, V and W are the bridge nodes of the respective clusters. The intra-cluster density of U is going to be three-fourth because it has three neighbors inside and among the four neighbors. Uh, so to penetrate to this cluster of node U, the Q, according to our kind of uh, notion here, has to be less than or equal to one minus three-fourth. That means Q has to be less than or equal to one-fourth. Similarly, for this cluster with V, it's again three-fourth, so its Q has to be less than or equal to one-fourth. For this class uh, with UW, it has three of its five neighbors uh, inside, so its intra-cluster density is 3 over 5. So to penetrate to this cluster of W, Q has to be less than or equal to 1 minus 3 over 5, which means Q less than or equal to 2 over 5. So the minimum among these fractions, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, and uh, 2 over 5 is going to be 1 over 4. So that's the cascading capacity of the network. So what it means is then if I employ a Q value, okay, that is greater than one over four, then there'll be at least one cluster. So in this case, actually there'll be two clusters that cannot be penetrated, okay? So is it good to have a larger value of Q or a lower value of Q? It depends on the problem we're looking at. So if you're looking at a positive information to penetrate to all the clusters, then we would like to have a lower value of Q so that the bridge nodes can easily adopt the decision. Again, Q is a threshold fraction of neighbors who should have adopted the decision so that some new node can adopt the decision. So if a bridge node has just few neighbors and the Q value is low, then if those neighbors are adopted the decision, then they will adopt and the information can enter the cluster. On the other hand, if you're looking at an epidemic problem, then you don't want an infection to spread to the clusters, then you would like to kind of vaccinate or make the bridge nodes to be rigid enough. So they would, we would need a larger fraction of neighbors outside the clusters to have already infected so that the bridge nodes can be infected and the infection can penetrate through the clusters. So, and for such problem, we, we need to have a larger value of, for the Q. And now you can see that the threshold fraction Q is kind of related to the intra-cluster density. And uh, the clusters that have the largest intra-cluster density will be then the blocking cluster of the network. Okay, so it's, it's difficult to penetrate through such clusters and we'll call them as a blocking cluster. So our research idea now to proceed based on all these observations is this. So what we want is we don't want to run a clustering algorithm to uh, you know, determine the clusters and then determine the bridge nodes of the clusters and find out their actual intra-cluster density and then decide what could be the blocking cluster and so on. We want to continue on this analysis that we started using initial adopters and see how can we estimate the intra-cluster density of the blocking clusters of the network. So continuing the same example as for motivation, so if you operate with Q value equal to 1 over 4, and if you just say start with W, which is the node with the, say, probably the largest degree centrality as the initial adopter, then just with W, we can start, if we use Q as 1 over 4, we can uh, may, uh, make W, uh, U and V to adopt the decision. And once U and V adopt the decision, at least one of their neighbors should be able to adopt the decision by still operating with Q as 1 over 4. And then the other neighbors can slowly start adopting a decision. So all the three clusters will eventually adopt a decision if we just start with W as initial adopter and use Q as 1 over 4. But if you uh, want to use Q to be greater than 1 over 4, say 0 0.3 like that, then just with W will not be able to penetrate the clusters of U and V. So whatever we try, we cannot penetrate. The only option is we have to include U and V as part of the initial adopters. So what we will end up seeing is if you start increasing Q uh, gradually, there will be a threshold beyond which if you increase the Q, there will be a sudden increase in the fraction of initial adopters, basically the number of initial adopters among the nodes in the network who should have adopted the decision in order for us to accomplish complete information cascade. Okay. 
So like in this case, unless we include U and V, that means instead of one node, we'll be including now three nodes as initial adopters. And that will be like, you know, a spike in the number fraction of initial adopters uh, that we need to start with. So that's what now is going to be like our hypothesis that we will increase the Q values in like, say, in units of 0 0.05. Again, Q is a fraction. So it, it, its values will range from 0 to 1. So we will increase Q values in minor increment values like 0 0.05 and see for which epoch or which uh, range of 0 0.05, there's a spike in the fraction of initial adopters. And again, we are looking at minimum. Of course, if all the nodes are chosen as initial adopters, then uh, there's nothing to think about. So we are going to look at the minimum fraction of nodes to be chosen as initial adopters. So that's why I indicate here F min IA, that means the minimum fraction of nodes to be chosen as initial adopters. So it's a hypothesis that when we conduct such an analysis on the real world networks, we will expect to see a spike in the minimum fraction of nodes to be chosen as initial adopters. So we'll be looking for this Q value, which I called as Q step, because it looks like a step function. So I called it as a Q step. So what does this Q step really quantify? Again, based on what we have seen so far, for a cluster to be penetrable, this one minus Q has to be greater than or equal to intra-cluster density. So that means Q has to be less than or equal to one minus intra-cluster density. So the largest value of Q before the spike because if you employ the same fraction of initial adopters after the spike, the cluster becomes not penetrable. So the largest value of Q that we can have for the cluster to be penetrable with the lower fraction of initial adopters, like in this range here, is going to be Q step. Uh, that means Q step is equal to one minus intra-cluster density, because if you proceed beyond that Q step, this uh, inequality no longer will hold good because the cluster becomes not penetrable. So that means the largest value of Q can be now considered as Q step, and that is equal to one minus intra-cluster density, which I call as intra-cluster density of the blocking cluster, because there exists more, there could be more than one cluster. And where we meet Q step, that actually quantifies the it's one minus intra-cluster density, where that intra-cluster density is that of the blocking cluster. Again, so Q step is one minus intra-cluster density. So one minus Q step will be the intra-cluster density of the blocking cluster. So we will coin a new term called the cascade blocking index because that's where the cascade really stops unless you increase the minimum fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters. So I'll call it as a cascade blocking index, which is one minus Q step. So again, one minus Q step is basically again the intra-cluster density of the blocking cluster. So this is what now we want to estimate. So we'll be measuring the cascade blocking index of the real world networks. And that is, we are going to show that it could be considered as an estimate of the intra-cluster density of the blocking clusters of those networks. So again, as I said, uh, a lower value for this cascade blocking index. So right away, the cascade blocking index is now intra-cluster density. So it's not one minus intra-cluster density, it's intra-cluster density itself. If a network has a lower CBI value, that means the network can be easily penetrated and we can complete accomplish com complete information cascade. So the, that's good for spreading information like positive uh, information. Whereas you prefer a network to have a larger CBI value if when you're looking at the, from an epidemic problem point of view. So if a network has a larger CBI value, it indicates that it's very difficult to penetrate through at least one cluster in the network and accomplish complete infection across all the nodes in the network. The problem now can be broken into two stages. The first stage is then to, for a given Q, we need to now determine the minimum number of initial adopters among all the nodes in the network. So once you know the minimum number of initial adopters, that divided by the number of nodes will give you this fraction of nodes to be used as minimum number of initial adopters. So we need to determine, we need an algorithm determine for a given Q, what is the minimum fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters. And then we need to do this analysis as we increase the Q for each such value of values of Q, you need to determine this minimum fraction of nodes as initial adopters and look out for this step function or in sudden increase in the minimum fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters. And when we do that, 
again, as I said earlier, we'll be incrementing in fractions of 0.05. So there'll be something called like a jump zone in which there'll be a spike, this spike. So we need to now zoom into this jump zone and determine the kind of very close value for the Q. And if you proceed beyond like this epsilon after this Q step, there'll be a spike. So we'll need another binary search algorithm that can be used, that can be run inside this jump zone to just uh, see where the sudden jump really occurs in the, you know, when as we increase the value of Q. So that's that's the second stage. And so that's another binary search algorithm we, we are using. So let us look at the first one. Like, of course, I assume everyone knows the binary search algorithm, the basic principles of it. So I'm going to go over it a little quickly here. Again, uh, here for binary search, my the invariance I'm using for the left index and right index of binary search uh, is just that when I use the value corresponding to the left index as the number of initial adopters, it's guaranteed that we cannot accomplish information cascade. Uh, on the other hand, when I use the right index as the number of initial adopters, it's always going to guarantee you that we are going to accomplish information cascade. So that's kind of the invariant I'm going to maintain throughout the, in all the iterations of this binary search. So let me use this example to illustrate the algorithm here. So in this given graph, I have Q as two over three. So that means I need at least two thirds of my neighbors to have adopted a decision for a node to adopt the decision. So let us use a degree centrality as the basis to choose initial adopters. So nodes would have larger degree centrality or chosen as initial adopters, depending on the number of nodes to be chosen. So here we have eight nodes. So my left index to begin with is zero because if zero means no node is initial adopter. That means definitely we cannot accomplish complete information cascade. Then my right index is say eight, which is the number of nodes. Uh, as I said earlier, if all the nodes in the network are initial adopters, then we have already accomplished information cascade. Uh, as I said, we are always going to maintain the invariant. The left index value uh, means uh, if you use the left index as number of initial adopters, you're not going to get com accomplish complete information cascade. If you use the right index as the number of initial adopters, you're going to have complete information cascade. So the middle index, uh, as in binary search, we, then we proceed in the iterations by computing the middle index as the average of left and right index. So for this uh, first iteration, middle index will be 0 plus 8 over 2, which is 4. So then I'll go ahead and choose uh, the top four nodes that have the largest degree centrality. If there's any tie, we could break the tie arbitrarily. That's what we observed in the simulations of the real world networks. Uh, ties doesn't really change the numbers that we're getting. In this case, two, four, five, six are the nodes that have the largest degree, and I think there's no tie here. So we'll end up choosing these four nodes as the initial adopters. Then you see the fraction of nodes to have adopted the decision is for the other nodes is going to be two third for each of them. And if you're using Q as two third in this example here, so that means just in one iteration, these are iterations of binary search, but I'm showing individual iterations within one run of binary search. So We'll go through iterations like this for the nodes to adopt the decision. But in this figure, I'm just showing just uh, one figure for each iteration of binary search. So since the fraction of nodes to adopt the decision is greater than equal to two thirds, all the nodes will adopt the decision and we can say there's complete cascade. So when there's complete cascade with right index as eight uh, and middle index as four. So what it means is we started with the number of initial adopters uh, based on the middle index value of four. So if we can accomplish, accomplish complete information cascade with four nodes as initial adopters, then there's no need to have the right index as eight as the number of nodes to be used as initial adopters. We can make the right index to be equal to the middle index. So that's how we are reducing the search space of binary search. You're starting with zero to eight and now we are uh, making it like zero to four. So for the next iteration of binary search, my right index will be four, which is the value of middle index. So left index is zero, right index is four, the new middle index is two. So we are going to now look for two nodes that have the largest degree centrality and say these are the two nodes, two and six, that have the largest degree centrality. Now with this setup here, then these are the numbers for the fraction of uh, neighbors of these nodes uh, that have adopted the decision. And you can see for no node, the fraction of neighbors who have adopted the decision is greater than or equal to two thirds. Everything is going to be less than two or three. 
So that means no, no new node will be adopted in the session and uh, we won't be able to accomplish complete information cascade. So that means if you use two nodes as initial adopters, we cannot accomplish complete information cascade. So previously we thought that number is zero. That's the value of left index for which we cannot accomplish complete information cascade. So now we find that with even with two nodes, we cannot accomplish complete information cascade. So move the left index to the right and set that to be two for the next iteration. So for the next iteration, left index is two, right index is four, the new middle index is three. So we'll pick the top three nodes with a larger degree centrality. There's a tie here, either we could pick node four or five as the third largest degree node, I went ahead of four. So when we use now these three nodes as uh, initial adopters, one and three will have two thirds of the neighbors to adopt the decision. So the next iteration of this information cascade here, two, one and three will adopt the decision. But that will not change the fraction of nodes to adopt it for five, seven, and eight. They will continue to remain with these numbers. And all these three numbers are less than two thirds. So eventually we can see that we won't be able to accomplish complete information cascade because 578 will just stay as it is without adopting the decision. So what it means then is left index has to be further moved to the right by setting it to be three. We need uh, even the three nodes, we can't accomplish complete information cascade. And as you can see, even if we started with two, five and six as initial adopters, seven and eight would have adopted a decision like one and three did earlier with four. But then in that case, one and three would, and four would not have adopted the decision. So either way, with three nodes as initial adopters, we see that we cannot uh, accomplish complete information cascade. So now what happens is left index becomes three and right index becomes four. And that's where we could stop. We need to stop because again, we are looking at integers, the number of nodes needed. So left index is three means with three nodes, we cannot accomplish information, complete information cascade. Right index is four means we, with four nodes, we can accomplish uh, complete information cascades. Once the difference between the left index and right index becomes one, then the value of the right index at the end of that iteration becomes the minimum number of nodes to be chosen as the number of nodes needed as initial adopters. So in this example here, for this graph, if you use Q as two over three, it means that we need to use at least four nodes as initial adopters if you use degree centrality. So all these things get along with it. If you use between a centrality, that number could change. But later we'll also look at all the results and we'll see for the real world networks and see how the centrality metrics really impact the numbers there. Okay. Once we now we have an algorithm that gives you this fraction F min IA, that's a fraction minimum fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters for a given Q we can then play with it by, you know, employ different values of Q and measure what is this fraction minimum of neighbors needed. And we did it like this for 40 real world networks. And this is one such real world network as networks like a novel based network or the characters appearing in the network and so on. We see that for this network, there's a spike after 0 0.5, for 0 0.55, the spike occurred. And we call this as a jump zone that we need to focus and or kind of zoom in and determine within this jump zone where is the spike exactly occurring. For the well-known karate club network, also we measured this did this analysis and we so that need not be like this just one spike. There could be more than one spike, but uh, there's always a larger spike. Okay, and that's what we want to focus in as a jump uh, zone. The other spikes were not as large as that largest spike we observed. So for like 37 of the 40 real world networks, we could really observe a very large spike. Like I'm showing here, after the increase occurs, what is the you know, fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters? And before the spike occurred, uh, what is the fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters? So the difference is what I'm showing here. So for like the 40 real world networks I observed, with the two centrality metrics, uh, this is kind of how the difference came up with. So the median of uh, the values observed for, for the 40 real world networks is going to be 0 0.44 with the degree centrality. And for between a centrality is 0 0.32. Again, this is a fraction. So it is going to be between 0 to 1. So in a range of 0 to 1, uh, increase of 
0 0.44 or 0 0.32 in the fraction of nodes to be initial adopters can be really considered as a positive sign that we are kind of targeting the blocking cluster of a network. That, uh, so that means at least one or more nodes within the blocking cluster need to be considered as initial adopters so that we can accomplish complete information cascade if you increase beyond this Q step. The first analysis led us to this jump zone where say this QL is one value and QR is one value, but the difference between them is going to be 0 0.05. And the corresponding fractions are like indicated as the bottom and top values. Now what we need to do is within this jump zone, again, we can run a binary search algorithm. If you use say the left index as QL and then move it to the right, we won't see a spike. But as we use the right index as QR, then we would have seen a very large uh, increase in the fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters. And then move that right index to the left. And then again, there will be a value of left index. If you increase beyond that, as I said, the difference is within this threshold epsilon. And I use epsilon as 0 0.001. I go as um, small as this. Uh, then we'll need to see an increase. Uh, so that's the second binary search algorithm and I'll use the Karate Club network as the example here to just go over the numbers quickly and to just show you how the binary search is run within this jump zone. For the Karate Club network, we see the jump zone occurs where the QL is 0 0.3 and QR is 0 0.35. So those are the two numbers we'll be starting with as the left index and right index. And I'll always check whether the difference between the right index and left index is uh, greater than or equal to the threshold for us to continue. Once it becomes less than the threshold, that's when we stop the binary search algorithm. So the middle index and this is going to be the average of 0 0.30 and 0 0.35, 0 0.325. And I'm going to now use Q as 0 0.325, the middle index value, and measure using our first binary search algorithm, what is the minimum fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters. And I get that to be 0 0.0294. And also for these values of left index and right index, I have what is the minimum fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters. I get that from the first analysis itself based on this curve. I can get those numbers. So now I need to compare uh, this fraction of nodes with middle index with uh, these two numbers and see to which of these two numbers it's more closer to. If this number at the middle index, the fraction at the middle index is closer to the fraction measure at the left index, then the difference between them will be very close to zero or actually zero. And that will be larger than, uh, sorry, less than or equal to the difference between the fraction measure at the right index and the fraction measure at the middle index. So if the fraction is more closer to the fraction measure at the left index, that means we are still to the left of the spike. So we can move the left index to the right and set that to be the middle index. So in the next iteration, my left index becomes 0 0.325. The right index stays at 0 0.35. The difference is still uh, greater than or equal to 0 0.001. I can proceed. So I measure my new middle index to be the average of left and right index. And using this as the Q value, I measure then what is the fraction of nodes needed as initial adopters and I get 0 0.3823. That's my fraction of the middle index. Now the 0 0.3823 is more closer to 0 0.4118, that's the fraction measured at the right index. And so it's more closer to that fraction compared to the fraction measured at the left index, as you can see based on this difference. So that means we are on the right side now, after the spike has occurred. So that this is the time now to move the right index to the left by setting the right index to be the middle index. So we continue like this until uh, the difference between the right index and left index is as long as it's greater than the threshold. Once it becomes less than the threshold, again, this is binary search. So in each iteration, the difference between the right index and left index will reduce by half. As you can see, it's first 0 0.05, then 0 0.025, it's 0 0.0125, and so on. So we are guaranteed that within six iterations. Why to six iterations? Because the search space is reducing by half in each iteration, and we know the initial size of the search space is 0 0.05. And uh, that's the, the difference between always a QL and QR. Divided by how small we want the search space to go to, uh, it's a 0 0.001. So that is one way to uh, determine the number of iterations needed for binary search. 
So log of 0 0.05 divided by the minimum threshold size for search space 0 0.001 to the base 2 because it's binary search is 6. So always after 6 iterations, we would have now uh, what is called the Q-step value. So how to get the Q-step value? So at, after the 6th iteration, we see the difference has come to be less than the threshold. And according to our analysis, that means we are here as the left index. And the right index is corresponding to this value of Q. The left index is this value of Q. So that is now our Q step. So the value of the left index, when we stop the iterations, is going to be our Q step value. So Q step in this case is going to be 0 0.3329. And 1 minus Q step is going to be the cluster, uh, cascade blocking index of that network. So for the Karate network, it's going to be that 0 0.67. So like that, we measure the cascade blocking index for all the real world networks. We consider like 40 real world networks. Uh, the number of nodes in the real world networks range from like 100 to about 5,000. These are the CBI values, the cascade blocking index values. As you can see, they are uh, reasonably larger values, not very small values. And the median for both degree and between a central decay might be 0 0.50. So that uh, is one end of concluding that the central metrics really don't play a major difference in the uh, CBI values. Now, uh, when I plotted the uh, actual values, this is how they look like, the distribution of the CBI based on degree centrality and CBI based on between a centrality. So you can see the CBI values based on degree centrality are a little larger uh, in terms of magnitude compared to those based on between a centrality. Also, I tried to determine the correlation between the two CBI values in the sense that uh, can we predict CBI based on between us using a CBI based on degree centrality or vice versa. For one reason, that between us centrality is more time consuming to determine, whereas degree centrality is just a very more quickly, it can be quickly determined. So the PSS correlation coefficient came out to be 0 0.54 it's indicating it's a moderate correlation. So we cannot really use the CBI degree values to measure the CBI between us values. And also we use the Spearman's correlation coefficient in the sense that it's a rank correlation. Can we use the CBI degree values to rank the networks? And is that ranking going to be same as CBI based on CBI between us? It's actually again, no. no. And the correlation is like only 0 0.55. From this perspective, uh, there is some impact on which centrality metric we use. And another way I also looked at is measure the um, absolute difference in the CBI values between the two, measure the two centrality metrics. And for um, about 30 of the 40 networks, the difference is within 0 0.10. Only like about for 10 networks, the difference came to be about 0 0.10. So that is one set of analysis we did. And this analysis now I'm going to show is actually going to validate the CBA values. You know, remember uh, our original motivation was to estimate the blocking cluster density. We can use the CBI as the estimate of the intra-cluster density of the blocking cluster of the network. Are we really quantifying that? That's what I'm showing how we validate that. So I went ahead and used the Lovian clustering algorithm to determine the clusters, the actual clusters of those real world networks, the 40 real world networks. So the yellow circles here, uh, those dots are indicating the intra-cluster densities of the different clusters that uh, the Lovian clusters that were actually determined. And the red circle is indicating the CBA value measured actually for that uh, network based on degree centrality and the green one indicates a CBA value based on between a centrality. And I have done this chain of plot for all the 40 real world networks. And you can see in all these charts here, at least in most of them, in almost all of them, the red circle is acting as an upper bound. And all the yellow circles are like less than or, you know, or to the left of the red circle. Most of the cases, the green circle is also is acting as an upper bound. Again, the green is based on between a centrality and the red is based on degree centrality. This is a kind of visual validation that the CBI value, uh, like in this, the five networks is very clear that uh, they are acting as an upper bound. Uh, likewise, you know, uh, for all the 40 networks. So this is kind of valid, visually validating that 
the CBI value is like an upper bound of the intra-cluster densities of the clusters out there in this real-world networks. This is kind of showing us that instead of running a clustering algorithm and measuring the intra-cluster densities of the individual clusters and determine the maximum of them, we can just measure the CBI value and use that as an estimate of the intra-cluster density of the blocking clusters of the network. Now that we, we have validated it, then I went ahead and also analyzed whether now can we use the uh, CBI degree values as well as or the CBI between us values to either predict uh, or rank the networks in terms of the uh, blocking density, cluster cascade blocking index, will that ranking be the same as the ranking of the networks based on the uh, largest of the intra-cluster densities of the networks? So the largest of the intra-cluster densities of the clusters is really what is our blocking cluster. It's quantifying the intra-cluster density of our blocking cluster. So instead of going through the more time-consuming approach of running a clustering algorithm and ranking the networks, can we use the CBA values? And with the degree centrality, we are getting a reasonably larger correlation coefficient, of course, not close to one, but it's moderate to strong, 0.72 for both Pearson's, which is useful for prediction, and uh, the Spearman's, which is useful for ranking in the network. So, and you can see the numbers are kind of correlated. As you increase the CBI value, as the CBI values increase, the largest of the intra-cluster density is also kind of showing an upward trend. With between us, it's not that promising. So it's the correlation coefficient is only like in the range of 0.5 and the distribution also kind of illustrates that. This is uh, one chart we can use to kind of really decide which central metric to go for to use as initial adopters. As we see from this visual comparison, the CBI degree values really more act as upper bound for relatively more networks compared to between us. And also here we can say that the CBI based on degree value centrality can be used to predict the largest of intra-cluster densities as well as be used to rank the networks based on the largest of intra-cluster densities. Uh, between the two centrality metrics, uh, degree centrality is really more appropriate to be used for the initial adopters. Now, with regards to the computation time, how much time it takes to really measure this Q-step value, because 1 minus Q-step is our cascade blocking index. Uh, again, I'm not considering here the time to measure the centrality metrics, because between us actually will take much more time compared to degree, so that will not be a fair comparison. So I just measured the uh, running time of the binary search algorithm that we went through for the Q-step within the jump zone. And as you might have realized that in each iteration of this binary search, the measuring is based on the middle index value for Q. So running the first algorithm within the second binary search algorithm. So it includes everything put together. So that time was measured, say, in milliseconds, and as a function of the number of vertices in the graph, so, and I did like an empirical model of that, and we see the time is like a function of less than v squared. Uh, so it's not going to be increasing uh, drastically as the number of vertices in the network increases, it's going to increase less than v squared. Uh, so same thing was observed between us also, and for both the square fits, uh, the R square was reasonably larger, more than 0 0.9. Uh, all of this indicates that our approach of using the information cascade approach to estimate the intra-cluster density of the blocking clusters of the network is a very promising thing instead of clustering algorithm. And again, we have to decide what clustering algorithm to use and so on. This is a kind of a different approach to estimate the intra-cluster density of the blocking clusters. And again, I thought there will be some algorithm for determining the minimum fraction of nodes to be used as initial adopters for a given queue. And I could not come up with one. And uh, I'm kind of a fan of binary search. Uh, so I kind of thought, okay, let me see, can we come up with a binary search algorithm for this? And yes, so it is possible to come up with a binary search for this purpose. So this is again a contribution for us in the literature. The literature uh, summarizes kind of all these things. So we can use the degree as a basis to choose initial adopters. Also, the time complexity is not going to be more than V squared for this. So with this, I conclude, I stop my presentation. So if there are any questions, feel free to ask now. Thank you very much, Matrajan. Thank you. Great. So Natarajan, this was all done for deterministic systems, right? Uh, yes. What is your 
conjecture with when this happens in a probabilistic system where nodes might not, uh, you know, just because you have a high degree, that doesn't mean you might have to propagate. Uh, have you considered extensions to probabilistic systems? We have done some work, Chris Kulman can say a little bit about it. Oh, okay. No, not yet. Uh, that would be a good idea to extend this research. Yeah. Natarajan, one question is, do you have a sense for what class of networks this whole thing might uh, not not work as well, uh, the degree-based heuristic? I think uh, looking at everything so far, I think it it will work more uh, for the social networks and kind of networks. There's more connectivity out there among the clusters. So it will not work for networks with uh, less connectivity among the clusters. So I think for biological networks, kind of networks with less connectivity, uh, it may not work. And I have had to try for biological networks, but most of the 40 networks I've considered here are kind of where there's reasonably good connectivity among the, the clusters. Right. Right. So for instance, uniform, you know, any like grass is not likely to work because they're so uniform in their structure. Yeah. And I'm also yet to try it on the theoretical networks generated using say the BA model or for scale free networks or the random network model or a small world network model like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you again to our speaker, uh, Nadarajan, for a wonderful talk today. Okay. Thank you so much and look forward to continuing the research. Okay. Thank you again. Thank you so much. Thanks, Golden. Take care, folks. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Thank you.